Well, good afternoon. This is a crowd that's ready. <laughs> good afternoon and welcome to the White House. Uh, my name is Tina Chen. I am the director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, and I am also the executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. On behalf of the Council on Women and Girls, um, we are delighted to welcome you um, to this very important event um, with the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, um, to talk about the importance of health care reform for senior women. Um, this is an issue that many of you have been active on. Um, we're joined here today by leaders of organizations that have been active in support of health care reform for seniors, um, and many senior women themselves um, who have experienced what's going on with our current health care system and why the status quo is not acceptable and doesn't work, especially for older women. We're really fortunate today to have with us several organizations that have been very active and have worked with us on this event, um, including um, Jenny Chin Hansen, the president of AARP. Jenny's right here. Um, uh, Barbara Kennelly, the president of the NIF. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Jenny. We also have Barbara Kennelly, the president of the National Committee um, to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. and Barbara Easterling, President of the Alliance of Retired Americans. Um, and I especially want to acknowledge another special guest right here in the front row who I just met, and that's Ruth Nadell, the 95-year-old, one of the founders of the Older Women's League, who's here with us. <laughs> Finally, we're also joined here today um, by Kathy Greenlee, who is our Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Administration on Aging. Kathy. <laughs> so we know Americans shoulder the burden of rising health care costs and increasingly inadequate health insurance, and women aged 55 and older have unique situations and health care needs that make them particularly, particularly susceptible to these rising costs. And health insurance reform is what will offer quality, affordable options for women without insurance. It will provide unprecedented security and stability for women with insurance. And importantly, importantly, and we're here today, contrary to what you may have heard out in the press, it will protect and strengthen Medicare for senior women. So to talk about these issues today, in addition to our First Lady, um, we have three women um, who've come to really share their personal stories, because their personal stories are what's most powerful about conveying this message. We have Kelly Bollinger from Owego, New York, Fran Garfinkel from Bethesda, Maryland, and Judy Stein from Mansfield, Connecticut. Um, but before we hear from them, it is really my great honor and pleasure to introduce um, someone who's become a very dear friend through all of this, who is a great leader on health care reform, um, the counselor to the president, the head of our White House Office on Health Reform, Nancy Ann DePaul. Thank you, Tina, for that introduction and for being such a great friend and colleague. And thank you to everyone who's joined us here today at the White House. You're here at a critical time. Nearly one week ago, the House of Representatives passed health insurance reform legislation. And this is truly... <laughs> this is truly history in the making. President Teddy Roosevelt, President Truman, President Nixon, and President Carter, and President Clinton all proposed health care reform. This president and this Congress are the first to advance a health care bill to the vote on the floor of either house. And I want to congratulate Speaker Nancy Pelosi and all of her team and the people who cast the courageous votes last Saturday. Next week, Majority Leader Harry Reid has announced that the Senate will continue its work to pass a bill. And I've spent time working with the congressional leadership, as has Tina and everyone here, and I know they're committed to finishing the job this year. While we know there's a lot of work left to be done, we've already made incredible progress on a tough issue. We're closer than ever before to enacting legislation that gives older women access to the affordable quality health insurance they need. The President's plan will strengthen Medicare 
bring down the cost of prescription drugs, and put some fairness back in the insurance system. It will ensure that older women no, are no longer forced to dig deep into their own pockets to afford the care that they need. And it will emphasize preventive care so that can help keep us out of the doctor's office and the hospital in the first place. It's the right plan for women and the right plan for America. But we know enacting these kinds of fundamental changes won't be easy. Remember, President Franklin Roosevelt, the architect of the New Deal, famously pronounced health care too much of a challenge and opted to do Social Security instead. <laughs> president Obama has said that he realizes he is not the first president to try to reform our health care system so that it works for every American and every woman, but he's determined to be the last. Americans all around this country, especially women, find they're locked out of coverage or forced to pay exorbitant prices because they have a pre-existing condition. A recent national survey estimated that over the last three years, roughly a third of adults under the age of 65 who tried to buy health insurance in the individual insurance market were discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. We know that has happened to some of you who are here today. It's wrong, and the President's committed to ending this discrimination. Even if you have insurance, you're struggling. Americans with health insurance at work have seen their out-of-pocket costs skyrocket. In the last decade, people who get their insurance through their jobs have seen their out-of-pocket costs triple. Americans all over the country have found themselves facing tens of thousands of dollars in debt, or even bankruptcy, because there was no limit on their plan's out-of-pocket expenses. We know that some of you lose sleep every night thinking about the bills from the hospital and the doctor's offices. That won't happen with health reform. Last year, millions of American seniors, folks who are covered by Medicare, found themselves paying thousands of dollars for prescription drugs because they fell into that gap in coverage known as the donut hole. Some of you know firsthand what it's like to fall into that gap. The President is committed to providing you relief from those frightening costs as part of health insurance reform. Here with us today are some women who've experienced the unfair and arbitrary world that is America's health care system today. Kelly Adair Bollinger, Fran Garfinkel, and Judy Stein have joined us today to tell their stories, and they and the millions of Americans like them are the reason why President Obama and his entire team are so committed to enacting health insurance reform. I know it's easy for some of us in Washington to get distracted in the back and forth. Sometimes it's tempting to focus on the political fights and the overheated rhetoric. But at the end of the day, this isn't about politics. It's about women like Kelly, Fran, Judy, and millions of Americans like them across the country. They're the people President Obama's fighting for, and they're the reason why we're determined to succeed. We're honored that they've agreed to share their stories today, and it's my privilege to introduce them to you now. Kelly, I think you're first. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking Mrs. Obama and the White House for holding this event and for inviting me to share my story with you. I'm honored to be here, but this story is still painful for me to tell. Four years ago, my husband and I were on the tail end of raising three amazing daughters. <laughs> Our youngest was a freshman in college, and we were looking forward to the next phase of our lives. Those plans quickly changed when my husband had a heart attack and suffered complications. My husband was consequently permanently disabled, and he had to leave his job. With that, we lost not only the income, but the health insurance plan that we had all been enrolled in. As though that weren't enough, this all happened on the heels of our college-age middle daughter, still a dependent, and still on our health insurance plan, having been diagnosed with a rare but treatable thyroid cancer. Given my husband and daughter's serious health issues, we knew that if either of them lost coverage, we would never again be able to afford a private policy. And even if we could, it would not cover their serious pre-existing conditions. Fortunately, 
I was able to purchase a health insurance plan through my job just before my husband's insurance expired and therefore ensure continual coverage for my husband and for my daughter. The problem was that the premiums and co-pays that we pay with the insurance plan we get through the small nonprofit organization where I work are much, much higher than what we paid for our previous insurance through my husband's employer. These high premiums, co-pays, outrageous prescription medicine co-pays, travel out of state to treat our daughter's very rare cancer, and loss of my husband's income led to a perfect storm financially, which ended up bankrupting my husband and I. We would have lost our home had my husband not eventually become eligible for disability benefits. We are now halfway through our five-year bankruptcy, and we've managed to make the payments on time. However, the bankruptcy payments and our outrageous health insurance premiums consume two-thirds of my monthly take-home pay. The good news is that my daughter has survived and is doing well. She's actually here today. All three of my amazing daughters are here today. And my husband, while still disabled, is stabilized. This is a difficult story for me to share. This sort of thing wasn't supposed to happen to us. My husband and I are both master's educated professionals, and we have both worked full time our entire adult lives in careers that give back to our community. We did everything you are supposed to do. And when we needed the coverage the most, the health insurance system failed us. I'm grateful to be here today to share my story, which I'm sure is many other people's story too. I'm a middle-aged woman who is a professional, who raised a family while working full time, who has been married over 30 years to a husband who is also a working professional. And at age 52, I am working now almost exclusively to pay our ongoing medical bills and the bankruptcy fees that are largely due to past medical bills. If bankruptcy due to unexpected medical costs, loss of employer-sponsored health coverage, and loss of income can happen to people like my family, it can happen to anyone. I truly hope the reform we seek will prevent my story from being repeated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. My name is Fran Garfinkel, and I thank the First Lady for inviting me here today to give my health care story. I hope that my health care story will help others to understand the pitfalls and predicaments that older women face when their health starts to fall and their medical coverage fails. In my case, I am 70 years old, and throughout most of my life, I've worked full time alongside of my husband, Eddie. We were independent business owners, at one time running our own craft galleries, and we then later marketed gift lines to other gift stores. We had no pension plans, and we paid for private health insurance on our own until we qualified for Medicare. We consider ourselves pretty fortunate. We still own the home, same home that we bought 42 years ago. We raised two wonderful children, sent them to college, and even brought my mother-in-law to live with us for the 25 years before her death. We have always taken good care of ourselves, eating right, staying active, and being blessed with pretty good health. We retired two years ago and began collecting Social Security. We continue to work part-time doing an art outreach program for special needs populations, which not only gives us joy, but also gives us a little extra income. Then, in November of 2007, I got the awful news. I had breast cancer. You can probably guess what happened next. Surgery, 
chemotherapy, radiation therapy, medication, but I never guessed that after all of that, I would end up facing a different kind of healthcare scare, the Medicare Part D donut hole. This past July, when I went to fill my prescription for an anti-estrogen medication that I will need to take for another three and a half years more, the pharmacist told me that I was in the donut hole and would have to pay for the medication on my own. I was floored. The med three months supply of just this one drug cost me $1,100. And on top of that, I'd have to pay the full price for the other prescription medications that I needed. I couldn't believe that I was left to fend for myself at the very time when I could use the help. Our expenses were already pretty hefty. How was I going to pay for this? I researched other alternatives, like contacting the drug company that makes this particular medicine to see if they would help me. I asked my oncologist's office about samples. It is such an expensive drug that free samples are not available. There is no generic equivalent, and I don't qualify for any drug assistance programs. I was truly on my own. I can't stop taking the medication, yet being, forced, being fixed on a fixed income, something had to give so that I could pay for it. So my husband and I have had to trim, cut back, consolidate, and eliminate. If it isn't absolutely necessary, it is not in our budget. We even rented out my mother-in-law's former space to help pay our property taxes. There's just no wiggle room left in our budget. This is not what I had planned for, for our later years after working so hard all our earlier years. And I definitely never imagined that when I faced a life-threatening illness, my drug coverage would let me down. I am still in the donut hole, and I know that next year I'll fall into it again, and probably a little sooner. That's pretty scary to me, because I can now understand what I've heard so many times from other women. One serious health setback, and your home, your savings, your job, everything is at risk of being lost due to health care expenses. Hopefully, my husband and I can continue to work part-time to help pay our bills. Hopefully, I will be cancer-free for the remainder of my life, and Eddie and I will be able to stay well so that we can avoid costly situations like the Part D donut hole. Hopefully, they will find a cure for breast cancer. And hopefully, Congress will soon pass health care reform that closes the Part D donut hole and gives older women and all citizens the help they need to be healthy. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Stein, and it will maybe surprise you that we didn't hear each other's stories before I begin to tell mine today because the themes are so similar. Thank you so much, Mrs. Obama, for having us here today to tell them. Like many of you, I am a mother of two wonderful daughters, one of whom wanted this to be bring your daughter to work day. <laughs> a wife, a daughter, and now, amazingly, a grandmother. I'm healthy. I tend not to catch the various viruses that run through my office and community. Like Kelly, I exercise, eat a largely vegetarian diet, live an engaged life, and get the recommended medical and dental checkups. So, like Fran, I was taken by surprise when I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer four years ago. I had had a mammogram just a few months earlier. But the bottom line is, as you've heard, stuff happens. We're all humans, and human beings get sick, even when they do the right things and take care of themselves. From a rare person who rarely saw doctors, 
I became a full-time patient and a full-time wife, mother, and lawyer. Even now, four years later, I'm involved with treatments and tests far more than I like. It's simply silly to suggest that people overutilize health care because they have health insurance. Yes, fortunately, my insurance covered most of my care. But many of the tests and procedures are painful. And as many of us know too well, the medications have dreadful side effects. No one would choose this. On the other hand, a lack of insurance authorization almost led me to skip important care. When it looked like my insurance would not cover them, I seriously considered foregoing some painful abdominal injections that I needed to keep my white blood counts up. At $800 each, $777 and some cents to be precise, I thought I'd wait to see if I got sick before continuing with the shots, which were daily. However, because I knew how to pursue an appeal, I obtained authorization and proceeded with the injections. A good decision since I almost needed a transfusion even with them. I continue now to be faced with decisions about the follow-up treatment and insurance coverage obstacles that I face. Most recently, my oncologist recommended my scheduled, uh, a scheduled MRI because my insurance has been rejecting claims for my MRIs, she reconsidered it. Since my cancer was found after a mammogram and I can't take certain therapies I would otherwise be provided, my initial tumor was found, as I said, after a mammogram. It's dangerous for me to go without the MRI and in the long term, likely to lead to more expensive care for me and the system. I had to urge my doctor to make the best medical decision for me and to leave the insurance battles to me. But if I were not a lawyer who has been fighting for proper health insurance for other people for 30 years, I might not be getting the treatments I need. My story, as you hear, is only different from everyone else's because I do have insurance, and I'm a lawyer and the founder and executive director of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. We represent older and disabled people with the focused mission to ensure fair access to Medicare and quality health care. We're all affected as well. My diagnosis and treatment history impacts my organization's insurance rates. I have 30 covered employees, and I pay over $400,000 a year for insurance. And we are a nonprofit. We are further unable to switch to other certain loss, less costly plans because of my pre-existing condition. We all get sick. We all get injured. But we don't all have insurance, and we aren't all health care lawyers. All women, all people need health care, and we all need help paying for it. This is particularly a women's issue, because we live longer than men, with more chronic conditions, and because we are also often primary caregivers for our kids, our spouses, and our parents, all of whom also get sick. I'm telling my story because I'm told it may help. Tell yours, too. We need to make our voices heard now for health care reform. We need quality health coverage, including a public option. <laughs> we need it now. I know this as a woman a patient, and through my work as a healthcare advocate. Thank you so much. I want to thank Kelly, Fran, and Judy. And, and Judy, it does help. It helps us remember 
why this work is so important and that it's urgent that we get health insurance reform passed this year. I now have the honor of introducing one of this administration's greatest champions of health insurance reform. Since becoming our first lady, Michelle Obama has been dedicated to improving the health of the American people. She's focused on how we can ensure our children live healthier, happier lives. She's encouraged us all, no matter how old or how young, to stay active. And I think we all know she does a mean hula hoop. <laughs> she has been an outspoken voice for health insurance reform. She's met with women and families from across the country and heard their stories. She's told her own story and spoken not just as First Lady, but as a wife, mother, and daughter. She's committed to making our country healthier, and it's my great honor to introduce the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. Thanks so much. <clears throat> First of all, forgive me. I've got children and now I have a cold. <laughs> Goes along with the territory. Um, let me begin by first thanking Tina Chin, uh, who's doing an outstanding job as director of the Office of Public Engagement uh, by opening up this White House to the American people and organizing events like this one today. She's just been a terrific asset and a dear friend. And let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and I also want to commend Nancy Ann for her extraordinary leadership uh, on health care, health insurance reform. Uh, I know my husband, who is traveling abroad right now, would agree with me when I say that without her, uh, we wouldn't have come this far. And because of her, we're going to get the job done. So we are grateful to you, Nancy. And of course, I want to thank uh, all the women who are here today. This is a wonderful, lively group. I heard you all giggling earlier today. Uh, but I also want to thank the, the women who spoke uh, today, to uh, Kelly and Fran and Judy for sharing their stories. Um, what they've been through isn't easy, uh, and I'm grateful uh, that they have been brave enough and open enough to share their stories with all of us. It takes a lot of courage. Um, these stories touch our hearts, and um, they spark in us just a fundamental sense of unfairness. Um, but the sad truth is that none of these stories are unique. Uh, these kinds of stories are being told in city after city, town after town, all across America. They're being told by women who lost their coverage when their husband lost a job or their husband passed away. Uh, they're being told by women who aren't getting regular checkups because it's simply too expensive. Uh, they're being told by women living on fixed incomes who can't afford the prescription drugs that they need. All of these stories reflect the fundamental reality, and that is women are among those struggling most under the status quo, the way things are. And women are among those who will benefit most from health insurance reform because the truth is that women, we have a special relationship with our health care system. Uh, in a lot of families, that's true because we are the health care system <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, eight in 10 mothers say they're the ones responsible for choosing their children's doctors taking them to appointments, and managing the follow-up care. Uh, and over 10% of all women are now caring for a sick or elderly relative. Uh, our entire lives as women, we are asked to bear much of the responsibility for our family's health and well-being. And yet, we often face special challenges when it comes to our own health insurance. Part of it has to do with the fact that women are more likely than men to do part-time work uh, or to work in a small business uh, and jobs that are less likely to offer the kind of insurance that you really need. In fact, over half of all women in this country don't have the option of getting insurance through the workplace at all. Uh, but even women who do have insurance face inequities under the status quo. 
Because women make less than 80 cents for every dollar their male co-workers make, it's more difficult for them to pay their premiums, especially when studies show that they're paying far more than men for the same coverage. And I don't think anyone here would be surprised to learn that a recent study found that one third of all women have either used up savings, taken on debt, uh, or given up basic necessities just to pay their medical bills. And as many of you know firsthand, these kinds of problems, the problems of coverage and cost, only grows worse when you get older, uh, making quality, affordable coverage harder to come by as we've seen today and heard today just when you need it the most. In the individual market, people in their early 60s are more than twice as likely to be denied coverage than people in their late 30s. Older women are more likely than men to face a chronic illness, but they're less likely to be able to afford the cost of treating that illness. And in recent years, studies have shown that women over the age of 65 spend about 17% of their income on health care. And that's just not right. Our mothers and grandmothers, they have taken care of us all their lives. They've made the sacrifices that it takes to get us where we need to be, and we have an obligation to make sure that we're taking care of them. It's as simple as that. America has a responsibility to give all seniors the golden years that they deserve and the secure, dignified retirement that they've worked so hard to achieve. <laughs> and that's exactly what health insurance reform is going to help us do in this country. Uh, now, I can tell you, um, I can't tell you, actually, what the bill that will ultimately land across my husband's desk will look like. None of us can. Uh, but I can tell you uh, just a few important ways uh, that the insurance system will be impacted. For starters, and this is very important, uh, your insurance will not change unless you want it to change. So if things are great for you, you're fine. <laughs> it will, however, become more stable and more secure, no matter what your situation is. Uh, there'll be a cap on how much you can be charged in out-of-pocket expenses in a year or in a lifetime. So there'll be a cap. Uh, it will be against the law for insurance companies to deny you coverage for pre-existing conditions. And that change alone will help us in the discrimination women face in our health care system. And also, insurance companies will be required to cover at no extra cost routine checkups and preventative care. Uh, and I'd like to also speak just a moment about what reform will mean for seniors in particular. And there's been a lot of misinformation on uh, this topic, so you know, I want to be, be clear, uh, and Nancy Ann mentioned this. Not a dime of the Medicare trust fund will be used to pay for reform. Health insurance reform will not endanger Medicare. It will make Medicare more stable and more secure. Uh, by eliminating wasteful subsidies to private insurance and cracking down on fraud and abuse, throughout the system. This administration believes that we can bring down premiums for all our seniors and extend the life of the Medicare Trust Fund. Now, my husband believes that Medicare is a sacred part of America's social safety net. And it's a safety net that he will protect, um, he will protect with health insurance reform. And I know that many seniors on Medicare are also concerned about the cost of prescription drugs. We've heard about it here. Right now, millions of seniors face huge out-of-pocket costs when their spending on drugs falls within that coverage gap. My husband is committed to closing that gap, which will save some seniors, as you've heard, thousands of dollars on medications and make prescription drugs more affordable for millions of older Americans. 
So what we're talking about. <laughs> affordable prescription drugs for Americans who need them. Medicare that's protected today and tomorrow. Stability and security for Americans who have insurance. Quality, affordable coverage for Americans who don't. That's what reform will mean for older women, for seniors, and for all Americans. So that's why I believe in this so strongly. That's why I believe in this so strongly. But in the end, I'm not here just as a first lady. That's not why I'm doing this. I am here because I'm a daughter. I'm here because I have an extraordinary mother who is 72 years old, young. <laughs> and I know there are countless women in this country who have loved ones who feel the same way about them as I do about my mother. And when all is said and done, part of why I believe so strongly in reforming our healthcare system is because of the difference it will make for these women who gave us life. So simple. These women who raised us, these women who supported us through the years, they deserve better than the status quo. They deserve a health care system that heals them and lifts them up. And that's what my husband is committed to doing, to building that kind of system in the weeks and months to come. So thank you all. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you all for your hard work and dedication, for listening, for being a part. Uh, and let's get to work. Thank you so much. <laughs>